Good afternoon. So good to see each and every one of you here today. I'm very, very thankful for Guyton thinking about me and, and uh, having me come and speak to you all about this subject. Like, I, I didn't know if he was going to really get into how he asked me or not, but he did. <laughs> Whenever I, I was looking back on my messages back on uh, January the 9th, he asked me if I would come and do this. And I asked him about the outline that whenever he needed the outline done, he said January 31st. My jaw dropped because I know I've, I've touched this with just the hem of the garment uh, throughout uh, our GBN studies and things like that. We actually did a few episodes on uh, do you really know your history? And we went through all the major denominations and started talking about the history of each one of them. And so I had a little bit of an idea of what's all going on, but never dove into it this deep. And um, I hope that my lesson today will be one that will keep you awake because this is the hardest hour uh, for a preacher to keep everybody awake and things. And they keep on saying that we were having leftovers and leftovers, and it seems like the later you get with the leftovers, the more scraps you actually get. So I hope and pray that, uh, Josh, <laughs> we're, we're up a creek, man. <laughs> No, but um, very, very thankful to the eldership in trusting in me for all these things. All right, so as we get into the study of the introduction to the Methodist Church, I want to start with a passage, if I can get this thing going, right? Okay, that totally messed up. <laughs> there you go. All right, I want to start with John chapter 5 and verse number 39. Where the Lord there, whenever he was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he told them to search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. He says, and they are they which testify of me. You know, a lot of times in the religious world today, we have individuals that look into the scriptures and they try to look at it in such a way as they are believing within themselves that they have eternal life. But Sadly, it is the case that if you have never obeyed the gospel and you have not become a member of the church that you read about in the Bible, you have no eternal life because we understand that Jesus is the savior of his body and his body alone. But whenever we start really looking into the purpose of this entire movement, the Methodist movement, one thing you'll learn very, very quickly is that the movement is to reform the Church of England from the inside out. That's what John Wesley had in his whole entire mind. And whenever we look into this a little bit deeper, we're talking about a church that is, according to 2010, the United Methodist Church was the third largest church in America. Now, I know that in every single city that you ever go to prominently, you will see the Methodist Church buildings that are out there, and they're pretty large in size. And that's because, population-wise, they are complex. They, 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 they're very, very prominent in this area. But one thing that I have learned as I've been doing my studies of the denominational world is that the best start is to actually look at the individual who originated the movement or the church to begin with. You can learn a whole lot about them. You actually learn a lot about the church itself. So whenever you think about John West of the man, he was born in 1703. 1703 in Epworth, Lincolnshire. Now, he, he was raised in a home of where uh, his father was an Anglican priest, which later on he would actually become as well. He was a big priest in the Church of England. But his father, who was Samuel Wesley, and his mother, Susanna Wesley, they actually um, taught their children. He came from a big family. But they taught their children how to read Greek as well as Hebrew so that they could actually study and read the Bible in its original texts. Now, how many parents do you find teaching your children that today? You, you don't have that. You, you rarely even have families that even open up the Bible themselves, right? As a family. But these individuals were actually raising their children in a very biblical mindset. They were encouraged to memorize even portions of the New Testament. And even to the point 
of memorizing chunks of the New Testament. Now, you think about that type of background, that type of raising, do you think that you're going to have individuals that are very religiously minded? Yes or no? Absolutely. So these individuals, John Wesley was a very religious man. He was one who knew a lot about the Bible. He could read the Bible in its original text, things of that nature. All that was great. But it also came down to it that after he became an Anglican priest and he went and got his degree, that some things actually started taking place. He started cha being challenged in certain areas. But it's interesting to note, though, that whenever you go back into the history of the Methodist beginnings, I found that there are six prominent major events that actually take place. And the very first thing we want to talk about is a brand plucked from the burning. Now, what this is all about is that whenever John Wesley was six years old, his, uh, his house actually caught fire, and he was caught up in the second floor of his house. Now, the whole thing is, is that the whole story goes that there was two individuals, uh, two men that actually stood on top of each other's shoulders and actually grabbed John Wesley and saved him from the second story window. And because of that, his mom and dad started looking at him in his life that God saved him for a particular special purpose in life. Now, from there on out, John Wesley would be describing himself, and especially in this event, a brand plucked from the burning. And he was talking about himself. Number two, one thing that you actually find is the Holy Club. Now, it's interesting to note that in 1729, during John's return to the University of Oxford, where he got his degree, Charles Wesley, who it may sound very, very familiar to all of us, because Charles Wesley was known for his, not only his teaching and his preaching, but also for his songwriting. We have songs that are actually in our songbooks, Onward Christian Soldier being one that was written by Charles Wesley, which is John Wesley's brother. And a lot of the songs and hymns that are sung in the Methodist church actually came from uh, Charles Wesley. But it's interesting to note, though, that in 1729, as he returned back to the University of Oxford, he was then set as head over the religious thing, the, the religious uh, side of things. Well, at that particular time, both him and his brother started a holy club. Now, within this holy club, this club actually focused in on the vigorous study of the Bible, also with prayer and communion. Now, what they would do is that every, they met every single night for mutual involvement, Bible study, and actually devotion, trying to make themselves known by studying the Bible. Now, you think about this. If this actually grows into knowledge a whole lot, what type of reputation do you think you're going to have? Man, these individuals are methodical in their studies and their devotion and things like that, which is how they got their name, Methodist. Now, this is what he actually wrote about this. Diligence led me into the serious thinking. I went to uh, the weekly sacrament and persuaded two or three young scholars to accompany me and to observe the method of study prescribed by the statutes of the university. This gained me the harmless name of Methodist. Now, this is from his exact writing. If you start looking at all these italicized type things, these are actually the word for word uh, things that actually came out of his own journals. Okay? Now, it's interesting to note as we continue going on, not only is this uh, Holy Club going to be taking part, which is going to actually lead into some other things into the rest of this whole entire movement. This is also going to lead into something as number three, the journey to Savannah, Georgia. Now, this journey that was actually taking place, now this took place, remember how I said the club actually started in 1729. In 1735, just a few years later, you'll find here that John and Charles actually set sail with a group of Moravians. Now, I got to define really what the Moravians were because they really put a big impact on John Wesley themselves. The Moravians were a German religious group that actually broke off in rebellion against the Catholic Church 50 years before um, Martin Luther actually did his treaties against the 
Catholic Church. So this was actually, according to history, what I have read is the oldest Protestant group outside of what we have Protestantism today, going against the Catholic Church. Now, these Germans uh, were rebelling against uh, the Catholic Church in talking about indulgences and allowing the, the individuals to actually partake of the bread and the communion uh, whenever the Lord's Supper was offered. On top of that, uh, they did not believe in purgatory and things, but yet what their whole entire thing was is trying to go all the way back to New Testament practices that you actually read about in the Bible. Now, that sounds pretty good, right? A good, good philosophy. But at the same time, as he was journeying on to uh, the colony of Savannah, Georgia, to spread the Church of England in the U.S., there was a great storm that arose. And this absolutely terrified John Wesley. But what he actually experienced was something a little bit astonishing to him. As he was being so terrified by this great storm, these Moravians all of a sudden were calmly singing. Now, I, I want to ask you, if you were terrified and all of a sudden you look in the same ship with the individuals that were not part of your group, but all of a sudden they're just calmly singing over there, would that bother your conscience? That would at least you know, bring up in my mind, what is the deal? How in the world are they going through all of this? Which, basically, we read this. He described this was the most glorious day that I have yet seen. Now, the interesting thing is, he wrote this. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans calmly sung on. I asked one of them afterward, was you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. I asked, but, where, uh, but were not your women and children afraid? And he, repeated, uh, he replied mildly, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. Now what this all affected him for the rest of his life that actually got him to question his own salvation was these individuals trusted in God. That no matter what the storms of life was bringing upon them, especially this specific individual situation, I don't have enough trust. I was frightened to death. Well, that was going to be a big deal. And he resulted in saying that this was the most glorious day that I have yet seen. And it was going to affect the rest of his life. Now, it's interesting to note that as they were over there in Savannah, Georgia, they began doing some very vigorous, vigorous things and making very vigorous standards placed upon themselves as an example for all those who they were even teaching. They even limited their diet down to just bread and water. They started living in, in just little huts. They began even refusing certain things in life that, that typically was just too hard for the individuals to handle. For instance, one thing that they were really pushing very, very hard within this, this whole journey and missionary was the fact that an individual had to be baptized by an ordained priest. And if you were not ordained and were baptized by an unordained individual, they did not accept your baptism. Now on top of that, even to the point that the, even the highest of the individuals in the colony itself, he even refused to even give them the Lord's Supper for the reason that they were not baptized by an ordained priest. Now, even refusing to do the burial service for an individual who was not even baptized by an ordained minister. Now, do you, you think, what type of reaction do you think they would have gotten? Well, it's interesting to note that one of the colonists said to John, I, I like nothing you do. All your sermons and satires upon particular persons besides, uh, he, he says, besides, we are Protestants. But as for you, we cannot even tell what religion you are of. We never heard of such a religion before, and you know not, and we don't know really what to make of, out of it. You think about the unsuccessful thing that they just encountered. 
They poured their hearts out. They, they did some vigorous studies. They did some vigorous lifestyle changes and things to try to reach the masses, but they were not listening. Number four, you find his spiritual experience. After returning to the U.S., he was very discouraged and spiritually deeply dissatisfied. He joined himself to a religious society one night that was held by the Moravians that were the ones that were making such a big impact on him on the ship. And what they were doing is that they were reading Martin Luther's preface on the book of Romans. And in that, you read that in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sin, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, I've got to ask this question. One thing that we're going to be studying here in just a few moments on what their basic tenets are of the Methodist Church, a religious experience is one of the key factors. Now, John Wesley is going to be referring back to this numerous, numerous times. And even in Article 9 of what we're going to be talking about, uh, Lord willing, here in just a few minutes, he's going to get into this. You remember how Article 9 says that a man is justified by faith alone. Have you ever heard that? If you've been through preaching school, I know for a fact you all have heard that. <laughs> this is where they all get it from, okay? Now, it's interesting to note, though, that he was listening to this preface written by Martin Luther on the book of Romans, and as he was reading, all of a sudden, this warm feeling came upon him, and he said, well, that warm feeling is what showed me that I am saved. Well, let, let me ask you, does that correspond with Scripture or no? It does not. But according to people's minds, and if you ever do some studies with individuals, they'll tell you about some of the experiences. That whenever you say, how do you know you were saved? Well, I was standing in the shower and God spoke to me. Really? All right. What do you say? <laughs> All right. So... You have all these religious experiences of where people then claim that whatever feeling they had, I want to ask you this question. Is, is it possible for feelings to be deceptive, yes or no? Can feelings tell you something that you're not really thinking it is? I don't know about you, but I, I've been an EMT for the last 13 years. When people start talking to, to us about chest pain and things of that nature, you know, I don't know how many religious people I've actually come across where they say, well, I'm... I just feel him right here. Well, if you're feeling something right there, you might want to go to the doctor. <laughs> okay? Sometimes you feel like you're having a heart attack, but it comes back being acid reflex. Can that happen? Absolutely. Feelings can be deceptive. Abra or, um, Jacob, after Joseph was sold into slavery and, the, and his children brought back the cloak that was dipped in ram's blood, what did he say? My son is without doubt dead. Was that the case? Now, he saw all the evidence before him, and he came to that conclusion, right? He just didn't have the evidence that was true. Experiences do not justify salvation. Number five, you read very, very quickly the outdoor preaching. Now, George... Whitefield, a man that John knew from the Holy Club back at University of Oxford, invited John to come and help him preach. Now, that was, there was no problem with that. John Wesley was very adamant about that. But there was something different about all of this. Now, typically preaching is done where? In church buildings. That's where typically preaching takes place. But John Whit uh, Whitefield was doing outside preaching, which John felt very uncomfortable because it was against everything that he had originally done. But after the fact of really thinking about it and helping him out, he saw that it was very, very effective, and people were really receptive to that type of preaching, and therefore, this would actually become the movement of 
or the, the method of this new movement. Number six, the meeting groups. Now, this is the new movement. Now, this whole entire thing actually would come down to this type of mission statement. To reform the nation, particularly the church, and to spread scriptural holiness over the land. I want to reform the nation. Now, I've got to ask this question because I know we had already talked about it in a previous study today. There is a difference between reform and restore. I've got, to, I've got to ask this. Has God ever given us liberty to reform anything? Yes or no? Do we have the authority at all to reform what he has already placed within blueprints? Do we have any right at all to go into, I, I know I'm, I've never stepped foot into Guyton's house, but I want to ask you, do, do I have the right to go in there to his house and start knocking down walls and things of that nature and change it the way that I want it? I don't have that right. Why? Because I don't hold the deed. I do not hold the blueprint, right? Now, so why do people think that they have the right to reform the Lord's church that he established? I don't know if you've ever studied in history or not, but whenever you have inside work within a kingdom in older times, whenever you had a revolt against the king, did the king ever take that lightly, yes or no? Absolutely not. But for some odd reason, the religious world believes it's all right to do it today. We can change it to fit the times. Sounds scriptural, right? No, absolutely not. But this was going to be the whole entire purpose of every bit of this new movement. Now, as they continued to grow, one thing that you'll find very, very quickly is that they started setting up class meetings of 11 members and having one leader over those meetings, and they would meet on a weekly basis. Now, this moral and spiritual fervor of the meetings is expressed in one of Wesley's most Famous aphorisms. Now listen to this and don't try to get confused. <laughs> Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Now, what basically in summation is he talking about? Every opportunity that you have, do it. And that's exactly what John Wesley did is what we're going to be finding out a little bit later in with all of this. They even continued starting schools for poor children and orphanages as well as with um, clinics. Now, by the end of John Wesley's life, he traveled around 4,000 years or 4,000 miles per year. It is said that by his death at age 87, he preached some 40,000 sermons. Now, I don't know about you preachers, but I don't think we're ever going to get close to preaching 40,000 sermons, okay? But he had 294 preachers, 71,668 British members, 19 missionaries, 5 in mission stations, and 43,265 American members with 198 preachers. Now, I've got to ask this. Do you think having those type of numbers, he was very successful? Yes. And all he did was devote his life to preaching and to getting the message out. Now, do you think that if we were to follow the same type of zeal and interest and, and taking up every opportunity, matching up what John Wesley did, but we actually preach the truth. Do you think we can make a big impact? Taking every single bit of opportunity to teach the truth. We can do the same exact thing. Wesley, however, taught his followers that they should not leave the established church or the Church of England but should carry on their work of revi uh, revivalism on the side. Now, that was the whole point of this whole deal. He never wanted them to break away. But just like even Martin Luther, he didn't want a church mentioned after him, but guess what they did? They started a Lutheran church. Was that in his mind? Not at all. 
He was just trying to expose the truth. Well, same thing even with John Wesley. He says, I, I want this movement to be on the inside and to stay with the Church of England. But they would not listen. Now, as we get into the main tenets of Methodism, it's important to note that uh, these are just some of the things that are actually in their um, articles in summation. The very first one is that man is free not only to reject salvation, but also to accept it, talking about free salvation by an act of human will. Basically this, if you want to accept it, you can accept it. If you want to reject it, you can reject it. Now, is that not biblical? See, here's what I think sometimes we, we, we do ourselves an injustice. When we're studying with individuals, the very first thing we really need to be doing is trying to find where we can connect. Okay? Because if we find where we can connect, that shows that we can agree on some things, right? Now, the same way that you agree on all of that is where you can then study in a little bit deeper on the things that's not true and to teach them in those aspects. Now, watch this. Number two, all people who are obedient to the gospel according to the measure of knowledge given them will be saved. Universal salvation. If you're obedient to the gospel, you'll be saved. Now, right here is where things start getting kind of hairy. The Holy Spirit assures man of his salvation directly through an inner experience. Now, he's referring back to his experience of what he had whenever he was at the Moravian um, uh, social event where he was listening to that and what that, that warm feeling that came upon him. At the same time, he also goes ahead and says that the Christians in this life are capable of Christian perfection and are commanded by God to pursue it. Is it possible to be perfect, yes or no? I'm very thankful that, that the Lord during his ministry said, and then I will look to him in Matthew 25. He says, well done, thy good and what? Faithful. You know what the word faithful and perfect have as contradictions? Perfect demands that you do every single itty bitty thing to its maximum extent, never failing. That's perfection. Faithful is that you are reliable. That an individual that you are trying, that you're doing your best, you're trying to be a Christian. Is that all God asked for? I put the standard before you and I want you to do the best you can to be obedient to it. Now, even John himself said that if we say we have no sin, what does he say? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the lies, he is in the light. And if we confess our sins, what does he say? God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you not thankful for that? Perfection is not even close to being reality. The next thing that you actually find that they have two sacraments. Now, sacraments are, are um, rites that cannot ever be broken, religiously speaking. The very first one is baptism, the tr uh, tr Trinitarian baptism. Baptism is not only a sign of, a, of profession and mark of difference whereby Christians are distinguished from others that are not baptized, but it is also a sign of regeneration or the new birth. The baptism of young children is to be retained in the church. That is Article 6 in their method books. Now, here's something that we've got to look at. When we start looking at it's a sign of a profession and a mark that basically shows the difference of the Christian from a non-Christian, which I agree with that, Right? But at the same time, he says it's also a sign of regeneration. Now, is it a sign of regeneration? In other words, is a person saved before or after baptism? Because spiritually, scripturally speaking, a person is baptized into Christ, right? When you're baptized into Christ at that particular time is when man is saved. It's not a sign of anything. It's man's obedience to the point of where that individual now has salvation. But according to the Methodist Church, an individual is saved before baptism occurs. Now notice, notice this. Number two, the second sacrament is this, communion. Methodists generally believe that Christ 
is present in a spiritual form in communion and not in the bodily form also. He says the United Methodist Church's, uh, uh, the discipline of the evangel uh, evangelical United Brethren Church confession says this. We believe the Lord's Supper is a representation of our redemp uh, redemption, a memorial of the sufferings and death of Christ, and a token of love and union with Christians have with Christ and with one another. Those who rightly, worthily, and in faith eat the broken bread and drink the blessed cup partake of the body and blood of Christ in a spiritual manner until He comes. I don't really have that much of a problem with that. Do you? It seems like they have the right concept of the, of the Lord's Supper down pat, but this is also Article 6 as well. Now these are just simply some of the main tenets of the Methodist Church, but at the same time there are some things that the Methodist Church actually differs from the truth, and I know we've already talked about a couple of those. Now, when you think about the organization in and of itself, this whole entire movement actually started in 1729. Now when you read about things in the Scripture, that is 1700 years too late. Now, I've already asked this question, but when did God ever give man the authority to perform anything in his will or in his church? Do we have the ability to reform anything? Do we have the ability to take what God has already established, change it up a little bit, make it where it's more suitable for me, and then after that, call it the church? You know, one of the biggest things, I actually was on the United Methodist Church website, and they had a chat box that you could easily uh, chat with an individual who is over the, the chat box with the Methodist Church. And as I was talking with them, trying to get a little bit more information from them specifically, I asked them some questions, and one thing that was very interesting is that this whole entire thought about reform which every major denomination actually took place during this Reformation movement. And they started changing things, just as the whole establishment of the Church of England when King Henry VIII of England uh, was being a Catholic and he wanted to divorce his wife and marry another, he went to the Pope and he asked for permission. The Pope said no. So you know what he did? He broke off and said, I don't have to take this, and started the Church of England, which basically holds the tenets of the Catholic Church, but at the same time allows you to divorce and remarry as many times as you want. Well, isn't that convenient? Why do you have all of these denominations? You know, Billy Graham put it this way, choose the church of your choice. Where do you find that in the Bible? I, I don't read that. Do you? Do we have the right to change up God's kingdom and call it the church and believe in the ecumenical type mindset, which by the way, whenever I was talking to the individual about all of this, they continue to say that we are ecumenical in mindset, which simply means this. We're all the church. And we are in harmony with the other churches, but you can be a member of whatever church you want to be a member of, and we're all going to heaven alike. Now, I've got to ask this. Is one church as good as another? Some basic questions that I simply ask whenever I'm studying with an individual about organization of the church and things like that is, who was your originator, right? What year was your church established? What do you go by? Where was it established? I mean, if it goes anything along, if it doesn't go along with like what Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 talks about there where um, it's going to be in Jerusalem when God is going to set up His kingdom. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 is going to be in the time of the Roman Empire. Joel 2 verse 28 to 32 talks about the experience that's going to be taking place that, by the way, Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2. You go to Acts chapter 2 and you start reading how Peter and the rest of the apostles were preaching on that day. 
And it's interesting to even note this, that he says this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he quotes exactly Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32. And at the very end of that chapter, he says, And the Lord added to what? The church daily, those who were being saved. Verse 47. What was established that day? The New Testament church. It was a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2. Every single bit of the fulfillment took place there in Acts chapter 2. So anything that is being established after Acts chapter 2, is it or is it not scriptural? Absolutely not. Is the church distinctive? Does it have characteristics that are only to the church that you read about in the Bible? Absolutely. You think about Colossians 1 and verse number 18 where he says that in all things, him being the head of the body, he says that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, if I'm going to be claiming that I'm a member of the church that belongs to Christ. Who do you think I need to be listening to? <laughs> if we're all the Lord's church, don't you think we need to be listening to the Lord? Right? Not to organizations and committees by, by which even their, their books, their authority that they even have. They even go, these are the books that I found that are the doctrinal standards for the United Methodist Church. The Articles of Religion of the Methodist Church. The Confession of Faith, which by the way, that is described and formulated every six years by a committee, a group, that decides what they are going to allow and what they're going to accept, what they're going to reject, and what things they want to change. I mean, if it all started with a change and you think you had the authority, then to its utter extent, how far can you go with it? <laughs> it's an open door. The general rules of the Methodist societies, the standard sermons of John Wesley, and John Wesley's ex uh, explanatory notes on the New Testament. But it's interesting to note that when Jesus was speaking there in John chapter 8, he says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Right? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, do we believe that? Well, if we're the church, there's a reason why it says in Acts 2, verse 42, whenever he says there, and they continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. Now, I've got to ask this. Is the apostles' doctrine separate and apart from what Jesus taught? No. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine because the apostles' doctrine and what Jesus taught were the same exact thing. Isn't it a coincidence that God never contradicts himself? Now, it says 1 Timothy and 1 Peter. It's supposed to be 2 Timothy and 2 Peter. Okay? I'm making that correction right now. All right? I made a little finger mishap. Or I can just... Charge it to autocorrect. All right. First, uh, Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen. He says, "And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work." Now, I want to ask you this question: If it is good for what to go by, what not to do, how to get right, and how to stay right? To make a Christian be thoroughly equipped unto every good work, what does every mean? Every. If the Bible itself, what you and I hold in our hands right here is complete, if it tells us what to go by, what not to do, how to get right and how to stay right, my friends, what else do we need? If 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says that he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, what does all mean? All means all. If that be the case, what else is left out? Do I need a committee to tell me what I need to go by? Do I need a committee to tell me what I need to reject and what I need to accept? No, I've already got that. The fact of the matter is this. 
when he says, And if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When he says there in John 17, 17, To sanctify them by your truth, thy word is truth. Guess what, my friends? Truth has already been taken. Anything else is false. And that's what our religious plea is. Because according to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, if any man does not bring this gospel, what are you supposed to do? Let him be hmm, accursed. Now, I don't know if you've ever studied that word or not, but in the Greek it simply is defined as being a cast away from God. Separated from God. Second John 9 says, if any man comes to you and does not... Um, bring this doctrine, what are you supposed to do? Do not receive him into your house, nor bid him Godspeed. Why? Because he does not have God. My friends, here's how I want to conclude. These individuals are in error. And I'm saying that with every bit of love that's within me. Because truth is truth. But if we were to take these points... And I've, this is just a scheme of what's in that outline that's in the book. But if we were to take these things and show them the truth about these matters, we can work to win them over for the Lord. May we love these individuals and guide them to where they can have salvation for their souls. May we not look down on them, but love them. Amen? I hope and pray this lesson has helped you. I appreciate your time and attention.